Hi, I'm Martin Kelly of Friends Journal. And in the current issue, October issue, we have an article by Joanna Jackson called Beyond Politeness, Confronting and Transforming Pain in Our Meetings. And we have Joanna here on Zoom with us. Hi, Joanna. Hey there. Um, so uh, your article has a, a lot of great juicy topics in it. Um, maybe we can get started with the, the three problems that you see Quaker meetings often having. Uh, and those are politeness, buried conflict, and stoicism. So um, I, I think we've all probably seen examples of this. Uh, this is all very common. Uh, tell me some of the things that you've seen around uh, politeness. We can start with that one. Um, the largest is people, I see people being afraid to disagree. In Quaker spaces, I don't hear people very often say, actually, I disagree, unless they've had nonviolent communication training or they're assertive or they don't mind bucking our norm. Yeah. Um, so like I share in the article, a teen told us that he was uncomfortable talking to people in Quaker circles because they wouldn't necessarily tell him what they actually thought. They would just try and agree with him as he was speaking. So he couldn't, um, he didn't feel very authentic in that. Yeah. And I guess, could that turn into talking behind people's backs or um, I guess just not being honest with them or if someone coming with a project and people don't really like the project sort of saying, yeah, yeah, maybe humoring someone about this. Yeah, as opposed to just being assertive and, and saying what I actually feel. And if I share how I feel, then it doesn't come out sideways later with someone else. Yeah, and it certainly can. Um, another thing you have, and I've seen this many times, is buried conflict. So I've seen this where like the meeting had some big fight about some topic 10, 15, sometimes 20 years ago. And something similar is brought up now and they're all like freeze and they don't want to talk about it. Um, have, is that what you're talking about here? Yeah, and I think that really impacts newcomers because people who haven't been in that community for 20 years won't know what are the minefields to avoid. It's really difficult as a newcomer to find those by trial and error and like find those by experiencing the shame that comes from encountering everybody when they're frozen. Mm -hmm. So it's to me, when I picture a lively community, I imagine one that has very few or maybe no minefields to navigate around. Yeah, I, we should give examples maybe of like buried conflicts that have happened. I, I know there have been meetings that like 20 years ago, a same sex couple came and they asked to be married in a meeting. And there was like three or four people who were really like kind of opposed and there was a the couple and it turned out that like everyone left, like the, the people who were opposed, they left because they were upset and the, the people who wanted to be married was left because this was such a, you know, deliberate process, deliberative process and they just wanted to get married. Um, and the people in the middle are just like, you know, deer in the headlights. And so someone else comes and they want to get married and it's sort of like, oh no, this again. Right. That's, so I've, I've heard meetings have that. What, what other ones have you, have you heard about? Um, I interviewed someone who, um, the, most of what I'm going to share is already from the article because it takes some time to distill someone's story rightly. But, um, we talked to somebody who spoke in business meeting once and received such a strong scolding because she didn't know that a school in the care of that community was a really contentious relationship with really specific ways of talking about things. And there was such a track record of embedded conflict that um, just having an outsider speak about that topic raised some hackles for people. And that makes it really difficult to breathe new life in a meeting because people who have energy or who want to join or have a union or or contribute to the community can't they keep running into that blockage and it seems like we're often sort of stuck on issues that may not be issues anymore if we actually start talking about them again yeah yeah i um i know that in one community there's like a, a joke about not being able to paint the walls because people disagreed about the wall color or the carpet color for so long and like imagine how much energy we waste on something small, avoiding something yeah. small when we could just talk about it and open it up. I will admit there was one meeting that I started attending and the first time I went, I looked at their cushions and the floor and I saw that they had recently like refinished the floor and they had new cushions. And I was like, they've been through that battle. 
for those who don't know, East Coast meetings sometimes will have, you know, horse hair kitchens from the 19th century and no one can touch them. Um, and I'm sure meetings that don't have ancient lineages like that also have certain things that, you know, you can't touch or you have to be wary of. So to find meetings that have sort of gone through that process is, is sort of liberating sometimes. That's true. And I think some of what we're talking about gets at the, um, that balance between fluidity and stability. Yeah. And in a lot of Quaker communities that I know, we, we have really moved too far in the way of stability or even stagnation. Mm -hmm. um, and different people are comfortable with different amounts of experimenting and newness too. Yeah, and, and it seems sometimes though too people bring up things like the people who want to change um, get frustrated then and, and leave. And so you, you, you have like the people who uh, have stayed are the ones that are most resistant to even discussing things sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And I see in my experience that sometimes falls along generational lines too. I watch a lot of my peers leave Quaker communities or Gen Xers leave Quaker communities if they can't find a foot in the door or a way to, to be in community there. Mm -hmm. Well, you also talk a lot about pain. So let's let's talk about like, what can we do about this? And like, what are some examples? So you talk about pain and pastoral care, and these are ways of maybe helping to repair uh, some of these wounds. Yeah, I think a really important place to start is just to admit when we have pain. And in some communities that can be easier than in others. Um, I visited a Quaker community about a week or two ago, and I heard from someone who was on pastoral care that they wanted to have more clearance committees. And I, as a visitor, volunteered because I was in a time of pain and I needed some pastoral care. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think when we, when we take risks like that and trust people who are strangers or even just admit, this is a hard time, I'm having a hard time, or I, I'm not sure where to go with my life, or I'm having a hip replacement and I feel unsure about it or whatever, mm -hmm. and we could admit anxiety and pain, then we really can bring enough vulnerability to a conversation that can deepen our connections with other people. So I think the first step is admitting when we're in pain. Yeah, and it's always nice to get out of the routine too. I mean, oftentimes you can go to meeting every week and you're there and you're in worship for an hour, you have a little idle chit chat and then you leave and we get caught into these, these sort of patterns uh, where we're not really getting to know each other. Right. Yeah, some people that I've talked to through the listening project have said that uh, they really have a hard time with the transition from the end of worship to the beginning of chit chat because those are really different modes. Yeah. And um, and for some people, worship can be an experience that takes them to a surprising place or a deep place, and then to just move to the quotidian and the routine after that can be difficult. Yeah, yeah, can be. Um, so. Uh, I don't want to leave out the third one. You said stoicism, um, which I sort of translate as avoiding strong emotions, and, and we do have that sometimes. Uh, how does stoicism uh, affect meetings? How do you mm. think that? That's hard to say for, for other people's meetings or for a community. Let me think mm. about that. I think stoicism blocks opportunities for people to really meet each other in a unique way. And for me, something I really value in a spiritual community is a place where I can share my emotions freely. Yeah. And so if I'm in an environment or a circle or a family or a friend group where strong emotions are discouraged or people freak out or get scared uh, when someone's angry or, or sad or gleeful, then I, I feel like I can't be my full self. So I imagine other people may feel that too. So stoicism can block opportunities for someone to bring their whole self to that meeting or to that gathering of prayer. And if, if our purpose is to nurture that of God in, in ourselves and others, but we can't bring our full self then we really can't do our work. Yeah, so, so what, what do we say to a meeting that has this, that someone, maybe even just one or two people has identified these as issues what, what advice do you have for them? I don't know. That's a great question. question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm at a point where I'm ready to 
give advice to other communities because each each we're talking about cultural change and that the way that a, a specific meeting gets its culture happens over years or decades or hundreds of years so yeah. i'm not really sure how to make a, a suggestion for cultural change that's broad like that seems like we need a clearness committee for the whole meeting that might be nice yeah another alternative is to to start in small groups um groups like spiritual friendship circles can break break into a new culture because they're recently formed and they're a subgroup so i find in my experience it's easier to sort of start afresh with a new culture by creating an interest group or joining a spiritual friendship circle and then we can we can say what we're here to do mm -hmm. in a small circle yeah, I have known meetings because I, I, whenever I go to a meeting, I start asking these questions and I visit a lot of meetings just because I'm interested in how these cultures change. And I don't know there have been meetings where uh, groups have felt like they were sort of stuck and younger groups, younger friends were felt like they were stuck and they started their own kind of little spiritual circles. And then when the older generation was ready to finally pass the baton, they could sort of move in. Mm -hmm. um, and this is like a group like the group I'm talking about that I'm thinking about for this one particular meeting who was telling me a story. I mean, they're all like in their sixties now. So this is now an older group, but they were talking about when they were younger, yeah. uh, you know, maybe they had family groups or something like that, that they built a cohesive kind of their own culture anew. And so we're able to um, sort of support the meeting when that older generation had uh, moved, moved along. So right. not part of the meeting, but not as active in the committees. Yeah. Another another method I just thought of is um, some meetings have people hold space during business meeting or elder during the business meeting, mm -hmm. and that helps to really create a container. So if someone has disagreement or strong emotion, we can move in trust as a group rather than out of suspicion. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. Uh, always good to read the room and see when there are. I mean, you can I can tell when there's tensions that no one's talking about. Um, yeah, I think it's you know. People can see that. Yeah. Maybe they have, I guess, an outsider, uh, insider, outsider, insider doing that. I, I know um, traveling ministers have also sometimes performed this role. I don't know if there's any real group of traveling ministers doing this, but I, I want to say that uh, for a while when the FGC had a traveling ministries program, they would sometimes sort of act as a emotional support to go into meetings and help out. So I don't know if anyone's doing that now. I don't either, but it, it, I can see how somebody who's a fresh set of eyes could uh, notice what's really apparent mm -hmm. to people, people who are new may be able to see that, which is um, difficult to see when someone's part of a community for a long time. Yeah, I don't know if traveling ministers are doing that service or not. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, more haphazard, I think now. I don't know if there's organized traveling ministry programs happening right now among unprogrammed friends. Not uh, yet. Yeah, maybe there should be. Let's, let's revive that. Revive it once again. Every every 15 years we have to revive, <laughs> revive these uh, uh, techniques here. Um, well, great. Anything else that you want to share about about this and advice to give someone, even if there's not a way of transforming meeting, if there's someone's in pain, should they seek out other friends nearby or or what might they do? Well, one thing that I shared in the article is I give an excerpt from the listening session, which I, I share some pain and two other people just hold space mm -hmm. and attend to that pain. And so um, for me, I think Quakers are really spectacular at listening. It's a core piece of what we practice sure. um, daily or weekly. And, um, and it's something that the world needs too. So, so I think a lot of this solution to um, things like politeness or the surface level relationships that happen when people are polite. Um, some of that can be broken through if we just listen really carefully to the emotion behind the words and accept that different emotions are fine to have. Um, yeah. I once told someone I was feeling rage about something and she recoiled like I was about to hit her. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I, I can feel rage without expressing it. Or I can feel rage without expressing it in a way that harms anyone. So that's something I'd like to see more of in our meeting is a healthy expression of emotion. Yeah, that would be great. And that's also sometimes ethnic differences also will have this, you know, have people coming to friends from uh, 
communities that are more emotional and find having emotions. And my wife's Italian, and so she like will always tell you what she thinks. You don't have to question what she thinks, and that was a problem uh, in in Quaker communities sometimes a, a bit too uh, in, in your face. Uh, and I know African Americans have also sometimes talked about how. Uh, they're sometimes seen as too loud. You know, individuals have said, you know, they were felt like they were too loud in the Quaker space. So I think we could be more welcoming just by being more welcoming to a wider range of emotions than we sometimes have. Yeah, I mean, you talk about different cultures. Um, that reminds me of some Quaker speak videos like Ishii Imani's when mm -hmm. she's making, friends of African descent are making room for different ways of being besides the white patriarchal way of being so yeah. there there's so much life that can happen when we expand beyond one way of being sure well and hopefully we'll start seeing more of that in meetings maybe so and as you continue to explore you can come up with some of the answers too great Let's hope. <clears throat> it'll be a future french journal article uh but for now we're uh the october 2022 issue that's uh online and uh uh, coming to mailboxes uh, as we speak. This came to my mailbox today. So uh, thank you, Joanna, for being with us and hope to see you again uh, soon. Thanks. See ya.